Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Brooke Kidd and I'm so excited to be doing an interview today with Sonia Renee Taylor. She is an incredible author and activist and we are going to uh, discuss so much about her life and her work. But if you don't already know about this great book, Body is Not an Apology, it's really incredible. This event is part of our Freedom Stories initiative. And the Freedom Stories initiative is an initiative with agencies and organizations across Prince George's County to tell the stories of social justice and anti-racism. And I'm excited to have this work today um, with Miss Sonia. Hello. Hi, Hi Miss Sonia Renee Taylor. Thank you for coming Hello. in today. Glad to be here. Good. So my name is Brooke Kidd, and I'm the director of Joe's Movement Emporium. And we're in Prince George's County, Maryland. And we're an arts organization guiding the power of creativity for change. And you are a wonderful thought leader in this space for social justice. And I'm so excited to talk about your work today in The Body Thank is you. Not an Apology and so much more. Excited to be here. And how are you in this moment? I'm doing okay. It is uh, a overcast Tuesday morning in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, which is where I reside. And um, I'm doing all right. I've got a pile of laundry that I need to tackle soon. But <laughs> other than that, I'm good. Good. And how long have you been in New Zealand and what took you there? Um, I've been in New Zealand now for four years. I moved here in 2017. Um, I was invited to be part of an um, international fellowship for uh, global change makers called the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Uh, and so in 2017, um, I I moved to New Zealand to take part in this fellowship, which was a three-year fellowship. Um, and I decided to become a permanent resident. So now I'm a permanent resident. Mm. Is the water and air as clean as it looks in photos? It, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like to tell the truth about things. Um, I mean, it's certainly cleaner than mm -hmm. it is in the U.S. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, it's, you know, I think this is one of the challenges of, of our time in general, right, is mm -hmm. what is it that we profess to be and then what does it mean to actually live up to those, to the ideals of, our, of what we profess, right? And I think right. we struggle with that on an individual level and I think we mm -hmm. start struggle with that at a social and political level. And so, you know, one of the big challenges is New Zealand is a huge farming industry, a huge farming nation. And historically that you know one the farming industry creates a lot of environmental challenges around right. co2 emissions and things like that as well as like um runoff in the rivers and those sorts of things mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that in the last you know decade new zealand has begun to actually really be like oh this we can't just say our rivers mm -hmm. are pretty like we actually have to do some things and there has mm -hmm. been some powerful work um the Fanganui river in New Zealand was granted um, human status. It was granted uh, wow. protect the protections that you would give a body. Um, and so okay. New Zealand is the first place to ever um, grant physical protections to a non-human entity to the river. Um, and so there are, you know, cutting edge things that are happening here around um, planet protection. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I like how you said that. Well, thanks for sharing that insight. Um, but you've got DC roots, and you are an artist and connected to our Joe's family through Noni and Gail. And um, mm -hmm. you know, you're, an, you're an accomplished slam champion. Um, <laughs> and so how does, how does being a spoken word artist prepare you for this work? You know, I think that performance poetry you know, I spent a decade making my living as a performance poet. And I think that mm -hmm. performance poetry really um, gave me the practice of, of one, analyzing the world, of mm -hmm. seeing things. So much mm -hmm. of my poetry is about how do I make sense of the world around me? How do I make sense of my own experiences and the experiences of others? And then how do I language that? And I think that the mm -hmm. practice of figuring out how to language issues so that mm -hmm. they are 
relatable and digestible to other people um, is something that I got definitely from performance poetry and slam where you have three minutes to get a point across, <laughs> you know? And so yeah. I think yeah. it is, it has helped learn. It has helped teach me how to be concise and intentional about, mm -hmm. about the message I'm trying to deliver. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, taught me to figure out like, what is the, what's the synthesis of the experience I'm trying to convey. So when now when I look at the world, when I look at issues of social justice, I am constantly tying um, together things that other people might think are disparate or don't go together, but I see connections. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, the practice of writing and performing really helped me learn how to see connections and name those. Mm. Wow, well said. I mean, performing arts prepare you for a great life. And, yes, um, without question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> without question. We, we we have a poetry coordinator on staff at Joe's, and I've been really excited to see what's been happening uh, with his programming. And uh, we had an incredible showcase this past Friday. You would have liked it. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The arts is transformed the direction of my life. I went to performing mm -hmm. arts schools from sixth grade through graduation. Um, and that shaped, you know, the entirety of my life, laid the entire foundation yeah. for how I would move through my work. Mm. So reading your book gave me so much to work on. And I just ordered the workbook. So I'm excited to dive in and, you know, practice these ideas. Um, tell us about radical self-love and how you believe it's the key to transforming the world. Um, yeah, so I believe that radical self-love is our um, inherent um, experience of enoughness, our inherent experience of our own divineness, of our own worthiness, that it is, you know, it is, it is, <laughs> it, we mm -hmm. arrived mm -hmm. here as, we arrived here in right relationship with our beings and the beings of others, we arrived here in right relationship with our bodies and the bodies of others, and um, over time and through the um, functions of oppression and marginalization and, um, you know, and systems therein, that knowledge um, has gotten buried in us. Mm -hmm. It is, we mm -hmm. can't hear it as loudly. We don't, we don't connect to it as powerfully as we did when we were children, when we were, mm -hmm. when we arrived here. Mm -hmm. And so radical self-love so many of the systems of oppression that we see in the world are a reflection of our relationships with bodies in which bodies we say mm -hmm. are good and which bodies we say are not, which bodies we right. say deserve resource, which bodies we say do not deserve resource and how we allocate um, mm -hmm. opportunity and power in our society based on bodies. Right. And so mm -hmm. radical mm -hmm. self love, if, if I'm inherently worthy, if I am inherently divine, if I am inherently enough, then there are no external systems that I need to validate that enoughness. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a world that is constantly asking us to place people in a hierarchy to, to, to decide who gets more and who gets less radical self-love doesn't need to be a, doesn't need to play inside of that system because it understands itself as already enough. And so from understanding myself as already enough, I begin to question the systems and the ideas that would, um, that would deny that knowing. I begin to challenge the places that have me believe that somehow there's some way that somebody could show up that is less than, you know? Um, and if we all understood that, if we all divested from playing inside of that hierarchy of bodies, um, all the systems connected to those hierarchies of bodies would be unsustainable. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we would cease to have oppression, <laughs> which, you know, people are always like, that's such a simple, yep. like, how, like, how is that mm -hmm. that easy? And I'm like, it's not easy. It is very simple. You know, conceptually, it's very simple. Um, the practice mm -hmm. of it is the part that is mm -hmm. challenging. Yeah. And, and how to get it to a policy level. And so the resources follow. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, but again, I think what's important and I think we often miss is mm -hmm. policy is made by people. Mm -hmm. Systems and structures are, structures are made by, people. made by people. They are not, you know, I always say they're not this amorphous blob that just kind of floats around and, and oppresses us. 
<laughs> they are made by human beings who have indoctrinated a certain set of beliefs that then they enact inside of policy and structure mm-hmm. and continue inside of policy and structure or go unchallenged inside of policy and structure. And so our assignment mm-hmm. is as we dismantle those ideas inside of us, we become change agents. We are mm-hmm. always either upholding or dismantling these systems. There is no neutrality inside of that. Mm -hmm. We are either doing something that interrupts it or we are doing nothing, which allows Mm -hmm. it to stand, or we're actively upholding it. Those are the options. And so um, if humans made it, humans can unmake it. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to buy copies of your book and give to my city council. It's a, a I love it. I would would uh, love it. (laughs) It's a a mayor and four council members and you know, they're, they're active because we're a small town in Maryland and, um, but this is the type of thinking that they need to have as they make budget decisions, as they make policy decisions. And that's what I hope that by uh, just being a megaphone for your work, we can help to keep planting more seeds of this radical self-love. And yeah, just, absolutely. I would, I would love to see mm-hmm. the book be proliferated through governments around the world. Yeah. I, would, I, that, I mean, ultimately, that mm-hmm. is my desire is that we, mm-hmm. that we lead and govern through a radical self-love framework. I, that is, yeah. that is yep. what my hope is. Well, every uh, so every state in the U.S. has a like a municipal league um, and that could be kind of the pathway for it. But, um, you know, I love community building and and that type of work. Um, One of the things that's so impressive in your book is these clear strategies you give around thinking, doing, being. And one that really stood out for me was the thinking strategy number one on equity and equality. Can you share a little more about that? Yeah, so I you know, I talk in the book about sort of understanding the difference between um equity and equality because I think that, mm-hmm. you know, we we have I certainly grew up hearing like no, everyone's equal. Mm-hmm. And you know, and we should make everyone equal and I was and I was like, mm, something about that has always felt like It does make sense to me. And and so in the book, I really describe it's important to understand the difference between equity and equality. Equality proposes that we're all the same and we all have the same amount. Everybody, you know, we've got, you know, if there is, uh, if I have $30 and there are three of us, everybody gets $10, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's equal, right? Mm -hmm. But Equality isn't always fair. And I think that that's a word that I think we think equality means fair, right? Mm -hmm. And fair is contextual. Fair is uh, proportional. It has a relationship to a larger understanding of other things. Mm -hmm. If I have $30 and there are three of us and I give everybody 10, but you have $30,000 already and you're starving, I haven't done anything that's fair. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If the other person is starving and, you know, and one person has thirty thousand dollars, but I give everybody ten bucks. I haven't done anything fair. Right. Yeah. What yeah. would be fair <laughs> is to give the thirty dollars <laughs> to the person who has nothing so that they can eat today and trusting that the rest of us are taken care of. And so equity says that we give people what they need, not what is fair. We give people based off of mm-hmm. the actual circumstances and mm-hmm. Um, nuance and context of their lives. Mm. Uh, And particularly given that we live in a society that didn't start off fair, right? Fair is only fair if everybody started at the same point. Mm -hmm. That is not the history of the United States. It's not the history of most of the Western world. And Mm -hmm. so the necessity is to to course correct um, the things that have created and sort of sustained inequity and injustice Mm -hmm. that have sustained marginalization is that we now have to compensate for the places where we left people behind. We, they actually need more in order to catch up. Uh, And so, yeah. And so in a thinking, doing, being framework, the first thing we have to do is think about how we understand this idea of equity. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we have to start practicing it. Practicing it in our daily lives, practicing mm-hmm. it in our relationship, practicing it in our relationship mm-hmm. with ourselves. And then from that place, we begin to create new habits about mm-hmm. how we how we do that. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Um, 
there's a, you know, these are terms that we're finding a little more meaning for right now as people are curious and demanding to know the things they haven't known. The one thing that's talked about a lot is health equity. What, how do we apply some of your uh, thought paradigm in pursuing health equity? I think that, you know, I think that part of that is about changing um, how we conceive and define health. I think that is part of the issue. You know, power lies in the hands of the people who get to make the definitions, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you get to make the definition, then you get to decide what health is and what isn't. And then you get to decide who either meets that bar or doesn't meet that bar uh, based off of the definition you got to make up. And I think that when we reconceptualize health as um, not just a physical state of a lack of disease, right? Like a lack Mm of sort of pathology inside the body, but also a lack of the pathologies that create pathology inside of the body, a (laughs) lack of the systems and structures Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. contribute to disease, right? When Mm -hmm. when we talk about health as a, a holistic ecosystem, then it requires different things of us. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you're no longer just having a conversation about someone's individual behaviors and whether or not those individual behaviors have made them unhealthy rather than talking about the um, context of where they live and the health of their community, talking about the health of the family structure that they exist Mm -hmm. in, talking Mm -hmm. about the uh, economic health of 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 the community that they belong to. All of a sudden we're having a conversation that is about um, the multiplicities of health, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than health Mm -hmm. as some individualistic assignment that either you're failing or you're not failing, right? Right. Um, And so that's what I think, you know, a radical self-love framework, again, calls you to look at how all of these things relate and what is it that we are not, where are we complicit in individualizing health such that we perpetuate unhealthy behaviors at a systemic or a social level that then recreate mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. what we're calling healthy uh, inside mm-hmm. of our, you know, inside of our medical industry. Wow. Yeah. How can, how can, if I'm just simply healthy by a set of indicators, I want to make sure my community is too. Exactly. Um, and, and what I would offer is that if mm-hmm. your community isn't healthy, then you're not healthy. Right, exactly. (laughs) You may have, have, you know, your blood pressure might be fine. Okay. (laughs) But that unto itself, you know, these singular indicators of health are not actually indicators of health. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, I know you get it when it comes to the power of the arts for, for, for social change. What role is and could the arts play um, in this next phase in creating the cultures of equity? Yeah. Artists, you know, artists are the storytellers. That's our, our job mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. to yes. both um, language culture, right, to make visible and material culture mm-hmm. in the world, um, but also to create culture, right, to, to shape what it is that we collectively understand as joy, collectively understand as connection, collectively understand as embodiment. And so the artist role is pivotal. You know, the artist role yeah. is, you know, James Baldwin says that the artist role is to to point out what isn't working. This is a right. raggedy paraphrase, mm-hmm. but, <laughs> um, but, you know, but it's, but it is to, 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 to name that which isn't working in society as well as to elevate mm-hmm. that, which is beautiful and glorious in society. And so art, like I said, for me, my artist journey helped me figure out how to understand the world as inherently connected. Right. Mm. As, oh, this relates to this. Yes. This yes. thing I'm looking at right here is actually telling me something about that thing over there that I saw yesterday. I didn't even realize mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And, and the art, arts are continually helping us um, pull together those threads to paint that yeah. full picture of the world that we're living in. And so the more 
honest and brave and courageous and fear facing artists are, the mm-hmm. more um, powerfully we mm-hmm. can actually address the issues that are, that exist in society that are keeping us from living our most full, vibrant, radical love lives. <laughs> yes, right on. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I just really enjoy your what's up y'all chat on Instagram. <laughs> it is, it's just brilliant. Um, you have such great culture commentary. Um, you know, how do you keep coming up with different subjects that drives you? in those conversations? Um, you know, I don't really, I don't actually come up with things so much mm-hmm. as people say things and then I have ideas. Okay. Uh, and yeah. you know, one yeah. of my favorite things about my, one of my favorite things about what's up y'all mm-hmm. is that they're really authentic in real time, um, capture of my mm-hmm. thoughts and ideas in response to the world that I'm in. Yeah. And so, you know, the more engaged in, things that are happening in the world, the more thoughts I have about them. And it's just mm-hmm. a platform for me to share my thoughts mm-hmm. and ideas. One mm-hmm. of the, you know, I, one of the things that I think is important for people to sort of just recognize, like I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I have expertise in areas, but I am mm-hmm. not on what's up y'all as some sort of expert. I'm up mm-hmm. at what's up y'all mm-hmm. as a, as a human being who has thoughts and ideas about the world mm-hmm. around her mm-hmm. and about what it is that I, and again, yeah. what I see where I'm like, Oh, we might not be connecting the dots there. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's where I think mm-hmm. we're missing the collective conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so as long as people are peopling, um, <laughs> I, uh, I have ideas and thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff happening. I might have some Good. thoughts about it. Good. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation with you and thank you so much. And for everybody, you can join in on a deeper conversation this Thursday at 5 PM with Prince George's community college center for the performing arts. This is part of our freedom stories initiative across Prince George's County to tell, uh, to share thought leaders and tell uh, stories and share ideas around social justice. Um, If you want to get more information with Sonia Renee Taylor.com, or at Sonia Renee Taylor on Instagram and other platforms. It's such good content. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much. What a treat to spend time with you today. My pleasure. It's a delight to be here. And yes, I hope, Mm -hmm. I hope that folks who are watching will absolutely join us on Thursday um, for the Prince Mm -hmm. George uh, community college talk. It'll be a good time. Good. Well, please come to visit when you uh, go through the DMV and next time you're here. Promise I will. (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.